This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Right, it's time to look at loan capital um, for F4, company law loan capital. Where instead of raising money from shareholders, from members or prospective members, as well as having members, it may be that the company decides that it will borrow money from a lender, from a bank, typically, uh, as a one-off loan, approach the bank and say, will you lend us 300,000? And the bank will say, rrr, 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 yes, okay. But they want security for that, typically. Um, but as an alternative to a bank, you could approach the public. As a public company, remember, it's a public company, not private. You can ask the public and say, would you like to buy some loan notes from us. We're going to issue, we're looking to borrow 300,000 and if you would like to become a lender to us then send in your application and your payment in multiples of say 100 pounds. And so people, this will be advertised in um, newspapers and uh, possibly even multimedia and people will say well that's a good idea because the coupon rate, the interest rate that they're offering does sound to be quite attractive. So people send in their multiples of £100 and will be issued a loan note. They'll be registered on their register of lenders called Re Register of Debenture Holders. And they will probably be offered security within the terms, within the prospectus behind the debenture issue. It'll probably say uh, this £300,000 £1, debenture will be secured uh, by way of fixed charge on the buildings or by way of floating charge over the assets of the company, including goodwill, incidentally. So that's, that's where we're at. We're looking at loans being made to companies. Now, these people are lenders. They are creditors of the company. They are not, through this process, they are not members of the company. Of course, as a shareholder, as a member of the company, you may want to also become involved in lending the company money. So in that case, you would be not only a debenture holder, you would also be a member there. But members and debenture holders are different categories of people. It may in fact be the same human who is also a, a member as well as being a debenture holder, but this one person with two different hats on. It is possible that you lend money maybe inadvertently you lend money to the company and that isn't secured neither by way of fixed charge nor floating charge i'll explain these charges in a moment or two and i once i had shares in a company and the company was taken over by a vulture and the vulture company said we're going to give you one of our shares for every 10 that you hold in in your little company we're going to give you one of ours for every 10 and we're going to pay you some money but not immediately we're going to give you a piece of paper that says we owe you money in three years time so i was a debenture holder and it wasn't secured so it is potentially the case that you've got really three classes of debenture you've got one which is very 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 well secured and, and one which is quite well secured and, and then the one that i had which was unsecured and it's important that we get those securities right in the right sequence and we know the, the, the pecking order of these secured debentures or unsecured debentures because that affects the distribution in a liquidation. Heaven forbid that we should be liquidated, but if there is a liquidation, then the distribution of the assets on a liquidation is dependent upon fixed security, floating security or no security at all. Debentures may be single debentures, they may be single, or they may be a series of debentures. I did say that the first instance, I said we went to the bank, didn't we? We go to the bank and say, will you lend us 300,000? The bank manager says, mm -hmm, yes, okay. And that will be a single debenture, one-off debenture, piece of paper, signed it, directors, company seal. It's there, they, they, this definition is the written acknowledgement of a debt by a company. The, the definition used to include the words usually under seal. Now, the requirement of, of some places some in the world call this a company stamp. 
So they stamped it. But it used to be an embossed steel, a seal. And you used to hold, pull the handle down and, and in, in reverse it would come down the seal and it would emboss the paper and the paper would be lifted up into the holes within the seal so that you've got the embossed name of the company there on the paper. That was the company's official seal. And usually a debenture had to, to bear the official seal of the company. But of course, company seals are no longer requirement. In the UK, companies do not need to have a stamp for their company. Uh, nor a seal for their company. It used to be the case that we did. Gone. No need for it. What's the point of it, then, six? Well, you tell me, what is the point? So, usually under seal is now no longer a requirement, but we still do have this, this um, written acknowledgement of a debt by a company. It may be secure, it may be unsecure. I've already gone through, and we will talk more about it. Maybe a single debenture, ask the bank, or maybe a series, invite the public to send in their multiples of £100. But in that situation, we need to keep a record of who are the people that have lent us money. The bank's not a problem, is it? Well, who has this £300,000 from? Who's lent us all this money? The bank. Oh, all right. Where's this £300,000 from? Where's who's lent us all this money? Oh, a lot of people sent in £100 here and £200, £300 there. Well, who were they? Don't know. Didn't keep a record. Of course you have to keep a record. So we need a register of debentures, and we also need a register of mortgages and charges. And we also need a register of debenture holders, the people to whom we owe this money, these creditors to whom we owe the money. If it's in a series, the debenture holders rank pari passu into se. That's a little bit of Latin. It means they rank equally amongst themselves. So just because one debenture is called Adams, and another debenture is called Zulu, doesn't mean that A. Adams is any better than Zulu. And in the event of a liquidation, and in the event that not all these debts are paid in full, all these debenture holders on this, on this single tranche, I don't know if you know the word, all the debenture holders on this single tranche, this single layer, all rank equally, and, and there's no preferential shown according to alphabetical sequence or age or, or abilities. So they're all of equal, they rank pari passu into say, they rank equally amongst themselves. The security may be a fixed or floating charge, may be fixed, it may be floating. What have I done there? Yeah, okay. It may be fixed, it may be floating. And in that situation, we uh, have to acknowledge and we have to record the security that has been given. To be valid, the charge must be registered within 21 days of its creation. But then we have a problem. What if we have two charges? What if we have two similar charges? And one is, one is created on the 1st December and the second is created on the 4th December. And they're both the same. They both have fixed charge, or they've got fixed security, or both floating security. And in that situation, where we have two similar charges on the same property, this one is registered on the 8th, this one was registered on the 7th. When he's coming along and being asked to lend money, and they say, can I look at your register of charges to see that there's no other people who lent money on this same property? And the register doesn't show anything because that's not yet in there. That's not yet been registered. So the register doesn't show anything. So this guy comes along and says, yes, I'll lend you money. And his loan is registered on the 7th. And the day after, along comes this one and registers it on the 8th. Who has priority? Now, it used to be the case, and that's what this note in the course notes says, it used to be the case that the one that was registered first had priority. And therefore, it was in your interest to make sure that your security was registered. Because somebody coming along later may register it before you and claim priority.
it's changed. And now, this line in the notes is no longer correct. I will correct it, but if you're still looking at this version of the notes, that is wrong. And that's the word which is wrong. It should be which is created first. I find this immensely unfair because if we have this situation where you create a charge on the first and register it next week and somebody later comes along and creates it on the day, day after or two days later and registers it straight away, they have priority? No. That's the one that has the priority, the one that was created first. So you thinking you're lending rights as a primary debenture holder suddenly discover that you're not because there was one created before, it just wasn't registered. I get upset by that. Not too emotional, I must admit, but I, I, I can't see the logic behind it. If there are two charges, of different nature. One is secured by fixed charge, one secured by floating charge. Two different securities, one by fixed, one by floating. Doesn't matter what the date of creation, the fixed charge always beats the floater. The loan which is secured by way of fixed charge over a specified property always beats the floating charge which doesn't attach to specified property. So, it is available for the floating charge debenture holder, the debenture holder where the loan is secured by way of floating charge, it is available for them to ask for, to be included within the debenture document, a negative pledge clause. And that negative pledge clause puts the responsibility on the company to say that if the company is now trying to find a lender to be secured by way of fixed charge, which will then affect adversely the property available to the floating charge debenture holder, then they must notify the floater. They must notify that floating charge debenture holder. And if they want repayment, then they can ask for immediate repayment. If they don't, if they acknowledge that instead of being the primary claimant of this property, which is their security, and somebody else is going to step above them, if they're quite happy for that situation to continue, fine. But if they're not, then they can ask for repayment of their loan. That's the effect of a negative pledge clause. I said I'd talk about the two different types of charge, the fixed charge and the floating charge. I used to, when I had a room full of students, I used to have this image of a building. And this building was the subject of the security. And if it's a fixed charge, it's as though a limpet mine has been stuck on the side of the building. And it will stay there. It's not a problem. It doesn't explode. It doesn't explode until the company breaches the terms of the loan agreement. And in that event, this charge will crystallize. The charge will crystallize and effectively it will blow up, it attaches to this one specific asset, typically a building. It doesn't have to be immovable, it could be a ship or an aircraft, so it moves, but it, it's tangible, non-current, long-term, permanent nature of substantial value, like a building. And in that situation, that would be the fixed charge debenture holders security. It attaches to specific asset. The company is not free to deal with that asset. Unlike inventory, inventory the company is buying it and selling it, buying it and selling it. And this 
is a current asset. And this moving, this changing, transient asset can be used as security, but not as a fixed charge security, not as fixed security to an event holder. It can be used for floater, but not for fixed. But the building, no, you can't buy and sell the building if it's the subject of fixed charge security. Fixed charge created within the six months of the commencement of a liquidation. That's where the liquidation commences, 1st December. Anything which was created between the 1st of June and the 1st December, along comes the liquidator and says, Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's a fraudulent preference. You can't, you can't say to an existing liability, an existing creditor, look, we're going to be in financial difficulty here. We're going to create security for the debt that we owe you. We'll grant you fixed security over our building so that when a liquidator comes along in two months' time, you at least have got your security because you're our friend and you've been dealing with us for all these years. If it's dealt with, if it's created within six months of the commencement of a liquidation, a liquidator will come along and he'll say to any receiver that's been appointed to, to sell the asset, to sell the building for the debenture holders, <coughs> say to the receiver, out, go. And the receiver can fight it. And if the receiver can show that at the time that this charge was created, this security was granted to the fixed charge lender, at that time the company was solvent, or that the charge was created in respect of new money coming in. The company sees it's in difficulty. It says to the bank, can you lend us some money? We're in difficulty. Lend us 300000 and we'll give you security over our building. This is new money coming in. So it's not security to an existing debt. It's security for a new debt. Then in that situation, the charge is good. But if it's an existing creditor, who's being given the title deeds or being given the, the <coughs> right to claim the building in the event of non-payment. And that is done within six months of the commencement of a liquidation. Then the liquidator is going to say to the receiver, on your bike. And the receiver would have to go. Incidentally, if this fixed charge was created within 12 months in favour of a connected person, a director, a director's spouse, infant children, company in which the director's spouse and infant children own greater than 20%, trust and trust business associates and partners of all of these people. If it's created within 12 months in favour of a connected person, then again the liquidator has got strong arguments to get rid of the receiver. Same arguments, but solvent or new money. In event of a liquidation, fixed charge holder ranks number one. Number one, numero uno. They have the title leads. They'll take the title leads, they'll sell the building, get the money, repay themselves their capital, which is outstanding, repay any interest, which is outstanding, repay the costs of realization. If there's any money left from the sale of that building, that will be paid back into the liquidator. If there's a shortfall and the building sells for less than the capital outstanding and the interest and the expenses, then that fixed charge debenture holder for the shortfall will rank down at, at layer number six when we get through to liquidations. You'll understand what I say, layer number six. But basically they rank, so far as that shortfall is concerned, they rank down amongst the unsecured creditors, the unsecured debenture, ahead of the best prioritized shareholders ahead of them, but right at the bottom of the creditors before anything gets paid to the shareholders. Where a floating charge exists over an asset, there may be a negative pledge clause, which I've told you about. The effect is to ensure that the floating charge debenture holder has to be notified and has to approve the situation where a fixed charge is going to get a prior claim over the same asset that would otherwise be available for the floater. And that's fixed charges. If we move on now to, well, I've got to get rid of crystallization. Oh my God, I still want to keep that, I'm sorry. Put the windows back. That's 
a fixed charge. I'll get rid of the fixed charge sticking on the side here. A floating charge floats. It's like a big cloud still full of horror. It floats above the building. And all the time, inventory's coming in and inventory's going out. Receivables are being created and, and receivables are, being, uh, are paying us. And all the time, we have these current assets circulating through the company. Circulating, circulating through the company like that. And in that situation, those assets are available to be used as security. That, incidentally, if you remember, is a difference between us as individual people or you and me together as a partnership. We can't use our floating assets, our circulating assets. We can't use those as security because that's against the law. We can use our building, our partnership building, but we can't use our partnership current assets. So a floating charge, unlike fixed charges, they don't attach to the specific property. They float like a big mushroom cloud over the building, full of glue, full of sticky horror. But then when a floating charge crystallizes, it's like pricking a balloon. And all this stuff comes down and it traps all the current assets and the goodwill and the tangible non-current assets that are not the subject of fixed charges. The cars, the plant and machinery, the fixtures and fits and the computer systems. That's trapped by all this sticky mess falling down. And along comes a liquidator and says, that inventory, I'm going to sell that. I'm going to collect all the money from the receivables. I'm going to sell the company cars. And they belong, the money belongs to, after you've paid the preferential creditors, but you'll see that in the list that I give you when you look at liquidations. When you've paid the preferential creditors, then you pay the floating charge debenture holders. But you can only pay them the money, which is realized by the liquidator, from the sale of the assets which were pledged as the floating charge security. So if the sale of the inventory isn't enough, and it was only the inventory that was available to the floating charge debenture holders, then they too will have a shortfall, and they too will fall down into level six, together with the shortfall from the floating from the fixed charge debenture holders. Anyone ranking high and doesn't get paid in full because there isn't enough funds available out of their security, they fall down into the same layer as the unsecured debenture holders. Fixed charge, floating charges, floating charges don't apply to specific assets. How do you determine whether a fixed charge is a fixed charge, whether a security offered is a fixed charge or a floater? It doesn't matter what you call it in any documentation. You may say we're giving a fixed charge over the um, uh, inventory and the receivables. No, it doesn't matter you call it a fixed charge. It's the nature of the security which determines whether it's fixed or floating. So you can't typically have a fixed charge over inventory and receivables. You can't typically have a floating charge over buildings, over, over substantial assets like buildings. So it doesn't matter what you call it in your paperwork, it's the nature of the security which determines whether it's fixed or floating. And it was established, this principle was established in the case that you don't need to remember the name of, but it was established in the case re Yorkshire Wool Comers. And it's a three point test, and, and here they are. A charge on a class of assets, this is floating charge, it's a charge on a class of assets. A class of assets, not an individual item of inventory, but inventory generally as a class. When the class changes from time to time in the ordinary course of business, we buy inventory, we store it, we sell it, we buy it, we, it's moving. It's, it's, a, it's a moving, floating, uh, transient asset as you're moving through the business. And so the business may deal with these assets. Until such time as the charge crystallizes, and then down comes the sticky mess, and it traps the inventory that is in the possession of the company at the time of crystallization. It may not, because of what was called, do you remember, do you remember the case, Romalpa, the Romalpa clause. 
Rimalpa and aluminium industry vase and this Belgian company that retained title to their inventory until the inventory had been paid for. So even though this sticky mess comes down and traps the inventory, the liquidator comes along and says, I'll sell this inventory. And these Dutch people, these Belgian people come along and say, oh, no, 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 you won't sell that inventory at all. That's ours. Or you can sell it, but the proceeds are ours. You pay our debt in full. So it's a charge on a class of assets where the class changes from time to time. But meanwhile, until crystallization, the company is able to deal with those assets freely in the ordinary course of business. Where a charge is fixed or floating no matter of commercial reality, it's not whether you not how you describe it in the document. In Tunbridge, and again you don't need these case names, in Tunbridge a fixed charge was held by the court to be floating. But in Cymex, a floating charge was held to be fixed. If you think of a, a finance lessor, which doesn't come into your syllabus until paper F7. And sorry, a finance lessor, which doesn't come in until paper P2. But a finance lessor is a person who gives out assets on the finance lease. And so they know, month by month, how much they are going to receive from the people that have leased their assets. That, strangely, is a situation where you can have a definitive, defined idea of the amount of cash you are going to receive next month, the month after, the month after, the month after. You know, because you've got these finance leases which run for three, five, twenty years, and the finance lessees are going to be paying you month by month by month. So that is a current asset which is available to use as fixed security. But it's the only one I can think of. A floating charge, do you remember a fixed charge will be invalid if it was created within six months? A floating charge will be invalid if it was created within 12 months. And if it was created within 24 months in favour of a connected person, again, a liquidator can show that it's invalid. And finally with debentures, loan capital. Comparing debentures with shares is a bit of a difficult comparison. It's like comparing the number of apple trees in the Ukraine with the number of available bedrooms on average in the hotels of Estonia. I mean, what on earth have got the two got to do with anything? It's the same as trying to compare a partnership with a limited company. They are completely different animals. Comparing a golden eagle with a, with a, a, a zebra. They're different completely. But there are confusions arise in students' minds as to whether or not a debenture holder is entitled to attend general meetings of the company, or whether a shareholder can get paid before a higher purchase creditor. So let's have a look at these differences, um, even though really they, a zebra has got four legs, four legs and a golden eagle has only got two. It's that basic. Fixed rate of interest for debentures. You can have a debenture with a floating rate of interest, but that is very unusual. Fixed rate of interest, a payable interest, the interest is payable even though there are no profits, because this is paying a debt. It's not a dividend. You don't you can't pay a dividend if there are no profits, but you have to pay interest because interest is a finance charge and is deducted in arriving at profit before tax. No votes. They can't attend general meetings and turn up and vote because they don't have voting rights. Unless they happen coincidentally to be members, but we're not looking at that, are we? We're looking at lenders and people, uh, people who are owed money rather than members of a company. Security is grand. Don't get security for shares. Members don't have security. And sometimes you get debentures with no security. I was a debenture holder with no security. I did get paid. Preferential entitlement. Fixed charge ranks right up there, number one. At number three, and the float, uh, number four, are the floating charge debenture holders. Then comes number five, and then number six are the unsecured debentures. Me, when I got taken over when the company in which I was a member. And then here are the, the shareholders. So the very, 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 very best shareholder is lower than the very, very, very worst 
debenture venture holder. All the debenture holders must be paid in full, and also all the trade creditors, all, all the creditors must be paid in full before a single penny is paid to the shareholders. They can take possession of the charged asset, these fixed charge holders, take possession of the whole of the title deeds. And along comes the liquidity and says, can I have the title deeds for the building? And they say, no, no, it's our building. The charge is crystallized, we're taking our security. And the liquidator may say, well, look, give me the title deeds. I will, because I'm experienced in this, I will sell the building for you and I will pay you out of the proceeds. I will pay you what money there is available to repay your debt, your interest, and I'll take the costs of realization. So it's likely that the liquidator will take those title deeds, but it's not necessarily the case. The bank, for instance, if the bank has got fixed security, the bank has got property departments and they will take the title deeds and they will sell it and they will repay themselves. And rights when the company defaults, rights that the shareholders don't have. When the company defaults and the charge crystallizes, the debenture holders can apply to the court for a liquidation order. Or they may apply to the court for an administration order and ask for an administrator to be appointed. Or they themselves can appoint a receiver so long as there is no administrator or an administration order in office at the time. So those are the rights and those are the differences between debenture holders that are creditors and members that are members. Okay?